Hi, it's Dave Bloxham with Beyond Guitars. Glad to have you back with me, and it's certainly good to be back at the bench and in front of the camera. Once again, now I've been looking forward to this video, especially because where we left off on the last video, Mike's dad's Gibson banjo neck needed grain filling, and I wanted to bring this video all the way through the grain filling process into color coats with the nitrocellulose lacquer. Well, I was in the process of doing that, and I got up to the color coats, and I ran into trouble matching color. I was just having a color issue day, you might say. So that put a halt to everything, and I had to re-examine re what I was gonna do. I have a lot of different colors here. I've been trying with all my dyes and some different experiments and approaches. Nothing was really gelling. It wasn't looking like I wanted it to look. So I've ordered some more product, and although it arrived yesterday, instead of now beginning another experimentation process, what I thought I would do is not cover all of that in one video, but just dedicate this video to grain filling. I've got that done. The neck is behind me on the other side back there. But uh, not only today to show you how I grain fill, how I filled the grain on this neck and the result I got, but actually the whole reason for doing it. So I have a lot of different species of wood and wood grain I wanna show you, both bare wood and finished necks. And there are sometimes you want to do the grain filling and sometimes you don't wanna do the grain filling. The result you're after is really what dictates what you're gonna do. So you may grain fill or may not, but because I want a glossy finish, like a brand new Gibson banjo, I want a grain fill. But there are some times you don't want to if you want the grain to show through. I've got a lot of slides to show you, so let's get on with that. We're going to talk all about grain filling, why you do, why you don't, and how you do it right after this. Well, I have something like 25 slides to show you, so we're going to move through these really fast. Let's start with our case in point. This is Mike's dad's banjo neck, and you can see the porosity of the grain, especially there where the volute is cut out. Uh, we have some end grain in the wood, and uh, along even the sides, you'll see how porous mahogany is. That is the nature of mahogany, though. It's not unusual, and this is not unusually porous mahogany. Uh, it's all... I've got a piece of... Uh, of uh, Milson mahogany I want to show you here too. Uh, this is uh, the same species but a little newer piece so it's not as dark but you can see the porosity. It's got it's got uh, pock marks all over it. I, some people call it pores. Uh, this is maple which is just the opposite. You can even see some figuring in this grain but no pores. It just is not a porous wood and you don't have to do this with the closed grain types of woods and I'll show you a number of each as we go along. This is a total mess. This is red oak and how you saw a piece of wood too will really reveal grain in different ways but this is a piece of wood flooring. Now oak isn't something we use in instruments much although Deering has made some banjos with oak but uh, not too much now. This is oak also but it's sawn a little differently. This was finished, this is actually my coffee table, and this is finished without grain filler. And you can see the porosity of the grain, especially in those striped areas where the grain is so evident. You can actually feel that with your fingers, but that's intentional. They want you to feel and see the grain. It's not completely covered. I threw this in just because it's a weird piece of wood. This is called lace wood. It's not particularly porous. In fact, I don't see any pores, but it is textured, so I'm not sure which way I would go with this. I might have to try finishing that, I never have. This is another uh, wood that uh, they call tone wood for musical instruments, it's walnut. And walnut is a very porous wood too, but it's in more or less kind of lines that looks more like cracks, but they're not cracks. This is a wood they're using more commonly now to replace rosewood, it's called paduk or padauk. And it is a open grain wood as well, you can see quite obviously all the little pock marks, but that's just natural when you cut the wood, all of those little marks are revealed. Now back to our case in point. This is our subject, uh, so we want that to look something more like the upcoming picture, which is a piece of mahogany. This is actually an Epiphone um, ES339. Uh, this is an electric guitar with a mahogany neck and a very, very thick poly, poly finish. You can almost not see through it, it's so thick. This is a thinner finish, it's also a factory poly, and uh, this was done obviously over 
a grain filler to make it so flat. The nice satin finish also has to be um, dealt with the same way, whether it's gloss or satin, because otherwise it would show the pock marks all the way through to the surface. You'd see all the little dimples in uh, the surface of the finish. This is my own banjo. In fact, it's the one you're listening to right now. This is a, um, a Gold Star G11 arch top, and uh, it uh, came to me with a broken neck, and I fixed the neck, and it wasn't aesthetically pleasing enough to, uh, I guess you wouldn't call it finish grade. It was more of a paint grade, so I finished it in opaque black, and uh, I really like it. It's uh, really my favorite banjo to play. I hang it on the hook on the wall all the time. That neck is never coming apart. This is a factory finish from the Gold Tone Open Back White Lady Banjo, and that is uh, actually maple, and they would not have to use grain filler. This is my uh, Rich and Taylor banjo with a mahogany neck, and this is a different finish. It's not poly, and it's not uh, nitrocellulose. This is a tongue oil finish, also known as China wood oil, and I really like the finish it gives it. I was doing a speed neck on this to eliminate the shiny, glossy surface, and uh, but I don't want to leave it bare, so I use the tongue oil, and it is kind of a long process because you have to let it dry in multiple coats. Uh, back to review. We are going to review some of the open grain woods like mahogany and the paduke and the uh, walnut. And uh, we're going to show you also, oh, there's the oak. What a mess that is. Some closed grain woods here. Now, we've got uh, yellow poplar to show you. Osage orange is an obvious grain, but no pores. So you don't have to fill that. The next one I have to show you here is basswood. That's used on real cheap instruments. You don't see that too much, but it is a nice tight grain. Our maple, once again, it's the same uh, same shot we had before. And this last one is almost devoid of grain altogether. That's holly. Holly wood, actually not the place, but from the actual tree. Well, I'm going to grain fill this mahogany because you can see now the necessity to do that to get a nice shiny finish. Today I'm using a product I haven't ever used before. This is the Stumac version of a grain filler, the Color Tone water-based grain filler. In the past, I'd been using a product called Crystalac, which is a good product but I thought I'd give the Color Tone product a try. I don't expect it to be very different from the Crystalac that I have been using. Uh, the characteristics of it are advertised as pretty much exactly the same. Now the idea is to take this pasty stuff and work it down into the grain, and you do have to kind of massage it into the wood to make sure it enters all the pores. Then you use a scraping tool of one type or another to remove the excess without pulling it out of the grain. So uh, some people will use a piece of burlap fabric. If you're not familiar, it's a super heavy, coarse fabric, almost like it's made out of twine. And uh, people will use that sometimes. I don't use that. I prefer to use a plastic scraper. I don't need to mess with burlap fibers left behind, and the scraper works fine for me. They're easy to get, easy to store, and easy to replace. One thing I did off camera, which I kind of uh, had a remarkable effect here, I didn't quite expect, was just to wipe down the neck with a rag uh, wetted with some lacquer thinner. And this surprised me how well it cleaned the wood. And uh, now it has much more of a uniform color. If you recall, the wood had a more mottled coloration from the staining of uh, just the dirt and grime was on it. But uh, just a little wipe down with lacquer thinner made a surprising difference. It's nice to learn at least something every day. So first, a couple of things. I don't want the uh, stuff to get on the headstock, which I'm about to apply. Uh, that's already finished. You, uh, If you saw that video, we went through that. I don't want it on the fretboard. That's going to be an oil finish on that, not actually a hard finish of any kind, just some, just some wood oil, like um, lemon oil will go on the fretboard. So I want to tape off these areas, and uh, the binding isn't a big deal if it gets on that. It won't hurt anything, but... Uh, I'm using that as kind of my tape-off zone, my buffer zone. If it gets past that, uh, it's got it's got a little trouble trying to get past that. So I'm using uh, this um, frog tape once again. I have good success with that. The main thing really isn't to uh, as as much to mask off the binding as it is to make sure you don't mask off the edge between the binding and the wood, which sometimes has little voids. And this grain filler will fill those little voids beautifully. So. We want to make sure the edge of the binding against the edge of the wood is revealed so we can get it down into those little spots. Just take your time, press it into the low areas first, and uh, be sure you lay it down and work it all the way around. Patience goes a long way, and prep work is so important to getting a nice finish. You've probably heard that before. It's true with painting, and it's true with uh, finishing instruments. 
So before I f do the grain filling, I'm going to fill these little screw holes. Now I'm, I may very well be going back into the screw holes, but I uh, just want to start with a clean slate here. So I'm going to fill these and uh, it won't be visible through the finish. So the coloration isn't important, but uh, they will be uh, visible if they're indented. So I want to make sure that they're not indented anymore. Black is the uh, finish for the headstock and the heel, if you recall. It's got kind of a, uh, I'd call it a sunburst neck, actually, kind of a, a fade between the black and the brighter color in the middle, and then black again down at the heel. So what I just did, I showed you the uh, glue. I've got some, um, some glue and some uh, mahogany sawdust here, made my own wood filler. So I'm pushing it down with my finger, but that won't make it flush. That'll actually push it down too far. But I want to, it's a uh, kind of a job where you don't want to work down and build it in there into the hole, make sure it's full and then uh, finish it off with the tools. So I'm going to go around filling all of these little screw holes. And if you see any little chips or any other little defects, injuries, abrasions or splits or anything, this is the time to address any surface imperfections. So um, one surface uh, quote in quotes, air quotes imperfection, you might notice is those serial numbers that are up at the top of the back of the headstock. And I do not want to fill those either with my wood grain filler or my wood, um, my wood filler that I made with the glue. So this is one of the body, um, actually you can get these at auto parts stores. I bought these at Harbor Freight. Uh, they're actually used for auto body work. You can spread Bondo or similar products, you know, body filler with them. And I found they work perfectly for this. They're easy to get. They're inexpensive. I've even seen them at Home Depot. So uh, easy to find. And I don't want to leave burlap. Burlap is kind of smelly too. I think they treat it with oil. Okay, so this is our turn now. We're going to break out the color tone wood grain filler. And this is... Um, going to be our next thing. Oh, I guess I jumped ahead a little bit. Okay, sanding down the wood grain or the wood filler that I used. Oh yes, um, you know, these spots, they kind of um, needed a little bit more, but because they're so dry, I want to make sure that they get a little glue in there first to make sure that this putty I made will adhere and stick. So I'm just kind of priming those spots once again. Um, so there's no question they're getting glue in there so I don't want any of this to come out. So we'll just work around each one of these holes once again and uh, do a little sanding off and we're ready for the grain filler. So here we go. Alright, so what I'm going to do now, I've got my Balin vinyl sealer. I'm going to use the vinyl sealer here to coat the entire back of the neck. That helps the uh, that helps the uh, grain filler to stick and it helps it stick more uniformly. So uh, just gonna add a coat of this over the whole thing. That's all it really takes, about 10 minutes, and that stuff is dry. And uh, here it is. It looks pretty nice. It's not a finished coat, but it is uh, kind of the primer coat, you might say. So we just take a second to admire that. Uh, it will need sanding after that because uh, we need a physical bond, mechanical bond. Just pointing out, too, that uh, the serial numbers are there. We want to preserve them. We don't want to sand them anymore, and we don't want to put grain filler in them and, and cover them up. It's an opaque finish at the ends black just like my uh just like my uh, gold star banjo is all black you can't see through it now i have used tack cloths to remove the dust but uh i don't know if i'm justified in my kind of hesitation about that because tack cloths have some kind of a sticky residue on them and i'm afraid that may interfere with my finishing and so I'm just using a small amount of water on my paper towel. It will evaporate very quickly and I've got the dust removed. So uh, there we go. 
Now we're ready for the grain filler. The grain filler contains water too, so a little water on the neck isn't going to be of any consequence. It'll all dry together. Now again, some people will use burlap, which is a very, very coarse fabric. Uh, they make sacks out of it for animal feed and that sort of thing. At least they used to. And uh, it's a very, very coarse material. And the idea with that, I think, is that it's so coarse that it won't conform to the grain and it will not go down into the grain and pull the sealer out. Now here I've done just what I didn't want to do. And I managed to put a little sealer on that first number. So I'll make sure I get it out of there. So I'm going to put some near it, but uh, not on it. All right, so now that's my first coating. And before it dries, I want to make sure I can kind of work it into the grain and flatten it out. Just work it on in, pushing it. I'm pushing down to get it into the grain. Now, I especially want it around the, the uh, volute there because the volute changes direction in the, in the grain and you have some end grain right there. So uh, that's good to get that filled up so we can get a nice shine on the end grain. If you don't use a filler like this, end grain will always look dull and pitted. All right, starting to dry here, so I want to keep moving on down and work it into all the grain everywhere. I'm kind of using this in a flat shape, not edge on like this. I'm using it sort of uh, at a low angle, so it pushes it in. You can work in circles. You can work in straight lines. I like to keep the tool kind of moving in different directions. I'll use it sometimes sideways, like this, across the grain. And then I'll use it along the grain, whatever it takes. Now, kind of the final, final bit along the grain seems to smooth it out the best. So you can see I haven't really removed much product. I've got very little on my uh, plastic knife here. It's all in the grain, and that's good. So that's it for now. We've let, let that we've spread it around and pushed it in the grain. Very important on the first application that you do a lot of the pushing. You get it into the grain, and you can use the palm of your hand. I'm using gloved hands, but you can use that too. Anywhere you see that looks kind of dry or grainy, you want to make sure it gets filled. Now, little bits of dirt are not really consequential. Uh, because this is all going to be sanded again. So any kind of inclusions like that will not will not be hanging around for long. Yeah, my tuner hole will just kind of pull some of that stuff out of there. And I didn't get it on the uh, on the numbers. So the numbers are still dry. I'm glad about that. Okay, so here we are with the dried product now, and it will have a texture that's a little rough, and that's quite normal, because after all, we just put it on with a little spatula-like thing. So once it dries, we need to level it out, and that's the process we use all the way to the last thing we do with the nitrocellulose at the very end when we're polishing. You put on a coat, and you smooth it out, and that so, that's, involves sanding. So we're just going to give it our sanding treatment here. Be really careful with high spots like the volute there and uh, of course the bulge on the side of the neck where the fifth string tuner goes. Right there is a real easy spot to sand through. So high spots you need to be super careful and just stay away as much as you can. You do need to sand it but uh, you know they're just uh, edges even there at the at the uh, at the heel of the 
of the neck uh, can be, really be sanded through fast, so be careful. I kind of roll it into a into a roll to get around the volute. And which way should I go sanding here? Should I go up and down the sides like that? Or should I arch it around like a U shape around the cutout there for the heel? Well, I try and do a little of both. I mean, when you're on the end grain, which direction is with the grain? It's It's like standing on the North Pole, which direction is south? Every direction away from the end grain is going to be with the grain, so you can't really go wrong. Uh, just going over it a little bit more here, and then we're going to get ready. Uh, here we go. Putting on more um, more grain filler. And you can really see when the grain shows through, and you just want to add a little bit more for comfort. So the process is more of the same that you've already seen, only a little less so. We just don't have to work it in as much as we did on the first round because most of the pores have at least some grain filler in them and then we just scrape it down and it is time consuming because we do need to let it dry each time so we're going to do it again here scrape off the excess level it out and let it dry now back to sanding and this is some hours later and I'm wetting my wet dry sandpaper in kind of a ridiculous way I really should have had the foresight to put it in water overnight and at least for a couple hours the, the paper on the sandpaper soaks up the water and it becomes really flexible and that's one of the two main advantages I, I get from wet dry sandpaper it's more flexible when it's wet and it stays clear better too because the water carries the debris out of the sand so that's not really what I'm after for doing it here it's more of the flexibility but uh, just uh, this is up to 400 grit now um, on this finishing and you know we're not really sanding the wood we're sanding the uh, grain filler and then when we get some finished coats on it we're of course not sanding the wood then either it's just getting more and more material so yet another treatment of uh, grain filler and you can tell by looking at it when it looks kind of porous -y. so that's what we did and that I finished it so we're at the end now I put on one coat of vinyl sealer and that's what we see join us next time we're gonna put on the color coats